morning and welcome to this first webinar collaboration between Bethnal Green Ventures and Connected Asset Management. My name is Rachel, I'm the Chief Impact Officer at Connected and I'm absolutely thrilled to be a part of this conversation today. A uh, little bit of housekeeping, so we'll start off with some intros and um, we'll move into some sort of deeper content um, and we're aiming to have everything wrapped up in an hour with the last 15 minutes or so for some Q&A. If you want to use the Q&A um, function at the bottom of your screen to just add your questions as we go through and we'll pick those up at the end. Um, as I mentioned, the session is being recorded, but if you have any issues throughout the webinar, if you um, just reply to the email that you got with the webinar link, uh, Millie's on hand, she'll be able to help you with any technical issues. So before we um, sort of kick off, um, three trillion pounds and five to seven trillion dollars. What do these numbers have to do with today? Um, although they might sound familiar given the recent news. Um, three trillion pounds is the amount that's invested in UK pensions. Um, this is a huge pool of money that's there to provide retirement ben benefits for retirees, but also um, can help influence the world that these retirees retire into. And five to seven trillion dollars is the amount annually, and it is global, that's needed to meet the UN SDGs, so the Sustainable Development Goals. So I guess the, the gap there is huge. The, the way that the finance industry needs to think about investing needs to change. We just have to see um, the weather warning <laughs> in the last few days to know that the world is changing and the societal impacts of that um, will become more urgent. So I think today's topic is really relevant. I'm really excited to be a part of part of this. And um, without further ado, let me introduce our panelists. Um, so first up, we have Jamie Broderick. He is the director of the Impact Investing Institute. He's an advocate for social impact investing and also a former lecturer of Near Eastern languages. Mm -hmm. Welcome, Jamie. Um, so Jamie, can you give us a brief overview of the impact investing landscape and how institutions are adopting it? Thanks, Rachel. Good morning, everybody. And, and it's so nice to be reminded that I used to be in the Near Eastern languages business. So thanks for that. So Rachel, let me start with a, um, a definition of impact investing. So we would say, so I'm a director at the Impact Investing Institute, and our definition is the same one as used by the GIN which is that impact investments are investments made with the intention to generate positive, measurable social and environmental impact alongside a financial return. But we would also distinguish between investor impact and enterprise impact. In other words, owning impact is not the same as creating impact. And let me give you an example. So a listed solar energy installer has an impact on carbon emissions but the investor's capital in that solar energy provider doesn't necessarily have impact. On the other hand, if I invest in a community development finance institution, they use my incremental capital to proportionately increase the amount of lending they do to social enterprises. That is impact. So what that means is that most impact investing occurs with new capital rather than the recirculating capital that you find in the secondary markets. This typically means that new bond issues and private market fundraising, as opposed to listed bonds and equities, where capital circulates in the secondary market. And this has implications for the different investor groups, some of which have difficulty investing in private markets, either because of the illiquidity or because of the extra expertise required in doing due diligence or because of the additional cost. So what we find is that retail investors, defined contribution pension schemes, and open-ended mutual funds often have trouble getting involved in private markets. Mm. The most common investors in impact these days are sophisticated high net worth in, uh, investors, family offices, charitable endowments, and then importantly, and in scale, some pension funds and some insurance companies. Mm. So, now that said, what I is what's important in this in the context of this conversation is that, and there are enlightened investors who are now finding ways to engage with high impact investments in the private markets. Mm -hmm. So, for example, you do have defined contribution pension schemes that have figured out how to include impact investments in their strategies, mm -hmm. 
you have retail investors using crowdfunding platforms to get access to impact. And you now actually have a robust impact investment trust sector. So the investment trust sector, the list of closed end funds that are listed on the London Stock Exchange that packages private market investments in a format that gives investors transparency, liquidity, and strong governance. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I, think it, I think that's sort of a, a layout. Let me just give you a couple of numbers just as a, as a way to visualize this market. I mean, you mentioned some pretty big numbers. I'll mention some smaller numbers, but um, it's, it's really hard to estimate the size of the impact of investing markets, but the GIN puts the size at about $700 billion, mm -hmm. which sounds like a lot. But if total managed assets globally are 150 trillion, that's still only half a percent. So plenty of opportunity to grow. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, a lot of the conversation there around um, how the institutions are starting to think about impact would be so relevant for today. So looking forward to unpicking that a bit. Um, Next up, we have Charlotte. Um, so Charlotte is the CEO of Pensions for Purpose. Um, I know uh, personally, uh, she is a passionate advocate for impact investing, and it's also on the pensions expert panel at the Impact Investing Institute. Um, so Charlotte, a question for you. How has the conversation around impact investing developed over the last few years, particularly in pensions? I think what's really um, interesting, so following on from what, what Jamie's been saying, is that um, impact investing has been around for a significant period of time, um, but I think categorised more as philanthropic um, investing, whereas now we see it as um, part of systems-based financial change. And we can see that through, for instance, books that are coming out around modern portfolio, moving beyond modern portfolio theory or donut economics. And we've seen documentaries like Kiss the Ground and Sea Spiracy that mean that things that we used to externalize and things that we didn't understand, we didn't embed into the way that we look at risk return. And so I think it's just an entirely different way of thinking about investing. And it means that pension funds now um, are starting to build into their investment policy statements and the way that they orientate their goals, whether it's you know um, net zero, Paris alignment, or whether it's incorporating the SDGs. Mm. We are seeing more of that that sort of that change, and it's about making sure that that language is the same language across the investment chain. Mm. So you know, are the asset owners asking for the same things, and are asset managers reporting on impact in the way that asset owners want to see? So I, I think, you know, there have been multiple things that have been happening, whether it's regulatory change, market change, that means that pension funds are looking at this. But in the past, where fiduciary duty made it a barrier and this idea that it was philanthropic in nature and therefore concessionary, um, it start, we're starting to sort of break through that and to see that there are these opportunities in the marketplace. And not only that, this presents a risk the pension fund but also an opportunity and as we've seen from the IIGCC's net zero framework you need to be thinking about risk mitigation on the one hand but also contributing to solutions and effectively is what impact investing is so it's entirely tied into the agenda towards net zero but also needing to meet these globally agreed goals as well and so I think what the big change is, is the embedding of by the asset owners mm. The concern, I think, for many asset owners is the measurement aspect of this. There are lots of different measurement frameworks. If we go back to GIN, you know, yes, the majority of impact investors are, are using the um, sustainable development goals to set objectives, but those don't necessarily represent the best framework for measuring impact. Mm. And that's where there's a bit of tension, I think, because we need some standardization in the market. We are seeing asset managers putting out impact product or uh, measuring impact, but according to frameworks that potentially suit their funds. Mm. Um, and so therefore we, we need something, we need some kind of independent um, review of that, mm. I think for asset owners to feel comfortable with it. So definitely it, it's a big change in the market. We're seeing it from investment consultants, from asset managers, from the pension funds themselves. And that's what's really making the difference. Mm. Yeah, thank you, Charlotte. Um, Tying into that, um, I'll introduce our next panelist, who is a 
an investment consultant. Um, so let me introduce Callum Stewart. He is a senior DC consultant at Hyman's Robertson, but is also on the governance committee of Hyman's own retirement scheme, um, where I believe you did also see an increase in contributions due to kind of shift towards a more sort of sustainable approach. So um, definitely someone to talk um, to in this space. Um, Callum, what do pension consultants think about imp impact? Um, well, first of all, thank you, Rachel, and, and good to meet everyone this morning. Um, I could probably keep this short and sweet for you. I think the main word that summarises for me is opportunity, um, and, and quite an exciting one at that, to be honest. I think we've got a great opportunity here to assist our clients to not just do, do good in the world, whether that's socially, environmentally, or both, uh, to tackle specific challenges that we have, but also to deliver a good or improved financial outcome. Um, and I think this as consultants is where we have a great role to play because we have a duty to shine a light on where there are investment opportunities for our clients, um, potentially opportunities that are much more aligned with the objectives they have. So in particular for a defined contribution scheme where trustees need to think about the things that their members care about, okay, getting access to that insight and information is quite challenging, but with technology is improving, we are increasingly understanding that members care about doing good in the world, whether that's environmentally, to address social injustice, injustices or whatever. So I think we naturally as consultants have a duty to include impact investing in the mix of investment considerations with our clients. Uh, personally, I find it really exciting because as, as a consultant, you, you want to be involved in advising solutions that can have a better yeah. impact on the world around us. Um, but naturally with the, the regime that we're working within, you can't do that. Uh, unless there's a financial aspect to it that's consistent with delivering the objectives that our clients have. But we have that. So that's not a barrier. We can absolutely improve financial outcomes in this way. Um, and Rachel, I'm glad you mentioned our own plan. So a quick word on impact there. Uh, when we did fairly recently move to a more sustainable approach, we've reduced the carbon footprint, but one of my uh, colleagues on, on the governance committee also challenged us during that to sort of say, are we going far enough with this? Should we not be thinking about impact? Um, so we will, absolutely. We are and we will be considering impact uh, in due course. Maybe come on to this later, but there are challenges in DC space around product availability. Uh, yeah. It's not an absolute barrier. We can be part of that drive, um, mm. to be honest, but it's something to be aware of at this stage. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, Callum. And I guess um, the next uh, panelist ties into that piece, particularly around opportunity. So um, let me introduce Paul Miller. Um, so Paul is the managing partner of Bethnal Green Ventures, which is the UK's first uh, VC firm that became a B Corp. Um, so BGV backs founders of technology companies that um, are coming up with solutions for a better people and planet. Um, so Paul, as an impact investor, how is BGV working with pension funds? Well, <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, we've been around for uh, nearly 10 years now. Actually, we started investing in, in 2012. And over that time, basically, we've seen demand on the founder side. So founders who want to set up and grow businesses that have a positive impact using technology. Um, we've seen that grow really rapidly. Um, so I, I was totting it up. We, we now get 10 times more applications per year uh, than we did you know, a, few, a few years ago. Um, and I think we're seeing really talented people wanting to move into this sort of mission-driven business space where they can um, you know, set out to solve some of these, these big challenges. And to be honest, that gives, gave us a bit of a problem at BGV because we didn't have enough capital to back all the founders who were, who were coming our way and particularly not enough to, to back them at multiple stages. So, you know, we, you, you only need a little bit of money to start a startup, but then if it, if it goes well, you need quite you know, considerable amounts of capital to, to grow that company. And so a few years ago, actually, we uh, sat down with our board and thought, okay, well, where are we gonna get this capital from to, to meet this opportunity? And rather than just sort of, you know, necessarily saying, okay, well, we'll go for the easiest source. Um, we thought, yeah, okay, what's the long-term source of capital that, that, that matches what we're trying to do? And the, the obvious one that kept on coming up and over and over again was DC pension schemes, because they are the most democratized form of capital, I would suggest at the moment, in terms of there are more people, certainly in the UK, who are members of uh, DC pension schemes 
than I think any other kind of financial product, really, mm. and it's certainly any financial product that invests. Mm. Um, so, uh, and that was important to us because these founders constantly ask us, okay, well, where does your money come from? Mm. You know, and they want to know where does the capital that we invest in them come from? So, um, yeah, that led one thing led to another, let's put it that way. And um, we've actually now joined uh, the Connected uh, Asset Management Group um, specifically to try and work on a product that means what we do can match the DC pension fund market. So uh, Connected are going to act as a connector, if you like, <laughs> uh, between uh, between what we do at BGV um, and hopefully DC pension schemes. And uh, that's, you know, we, we announced that a few weeks ago. We're very excited about it. But we certainly think that in the, the medium to long term, uh, DC pension schemes are a really good source of capital for uh, the tech for good and impact investing market. Mm. Absolutely. Um, and looking forward to hearing a bit more about that, Paul. Um, Jamie, if we if we take a bit of a deeper dive and we're thinking about the helicopter view of the impact investing landscape, um, what are the different asset classes that are available in this space? Or would you think it's better to think about impact more along themes or, uh, you know, Charlotte mentioned the SDGs. Is it, you know, should it be thought about from that perspective rather than kind of more traditionally? Well, Rachel, I think it's legitimate to have multiple lenses and multiple ways of looking at it. I mean, I, I, my, I have an investment background, so I like to look at things from an investment standpoint. And the one observation I would make is that I can't think of an asset class where you can't have impact. So you can have impact in cash, in equities, in fixed income, in alternatives, in real estate, in natural capital, in, you know, in pretty much every category. So, and the reason I like looking at it from as an asset class is that it means that anybody who has a asset allocation, anybody who has an investment portfolio with an asset allocation in asset classes could be incorporating impact investments into their existing asset class allocation. So if you have private equity, you can do impact private equity. If you're invested in venture, you can invest in impact venture like BGV. You can even, I mean, uh, cash is probably the most problematic one, but you can buy deposits of social banks that put their deposits to work lending to social enterprises and mm -hmm. charities. So I like to, I like to think of, it, uh, of the availability in, in any asset class that you might hold in your portfolio today, including pension funds, you could be uh, opening up those asset classes to impact versions of exactly mm -hmm. what you're investing in now. And I think that's an important thing for pensions to be thinking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess leading on from that, Paul, when we're thinking about um, pensions specifically and their asset allocation, um, and I guess particularly in the tech for good world, which is kind of your space, um, could you kind of give an overview of what um, tech for good could offer pensions if they were to allocate to, to that in, in their portfolio? Yeah, well, uh, so I don't I don't underestimate the difficulties of doing it because you know it is it is difficult for pension funds to, to allocate to venture. It's difficult, I think, to, to allocate to impact because that's it's new. But I think there is certainly in terms of returns, we're we're matching our uh, you know mainstream counterparts in the in the VC uh, world. There's uh, there's no there's no sacrifice in returns for from the point of view of doing impact VC rather than VC. Um, I think. That potentially the the big thing that that makes a difference about what we do is is engagement with mm -hmm. with with members. Um, certainly, you know we know that uh, we, we we our existing investors like love the stories and the impact mm -hmm. that 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 our our ventures are having. You know that's everything from companies like Second Nature, which is helping to prevent type two diabetes, through to uh, Fairphone, which has produced a more sustainable. Uh, you know, a phone handset. You know, all these these stories really get mm. people excited, and they like to know that their their money is is going to those um, those kinds of businesses and having an impact. And obviously, we can give them the figures as well. We can show like how many people have been touched by you know, investments made uh, through through their capital. So I think that engagement, which I guess will, you know, I'm, I'm not not an expert on this, but others more so. But my sense is that that could lead to more contributions which could lead to better outcomes for, for pension fund members. So, you know, I think that that's great investments that people get excited about that don't sacrifice returns, but that provide real opportunities for engagement that lead to greater contributions. I think that's the chain of um, what, what Tech for Good particularly can, can offer to pension funds. 
Yeah, I would absolutely agree. That member comms piece, particularly when we're thinking about auto enrollment, where you know engagement could be low, having something that's powerful and, and bringing it to life, is, you know, is really important. Um, but you touched on some of the kind of barriers, and I guess a question for you, Charlotte. In the conversations you're having, what would you say the unique barriers are to pension funds adopting impact? And I think we've touched on a few of them already. Um, but I guess, does it also differ between the type of scheme, um, DB versus DC? If, if you could paint that picture a little bit. Uh, I think I think definitely. I mean, there are... So uh, impact offers a really interesting opportunity because it, it, it also allows you to be able to engage with your members in a way that means they'll contribute more and ultimately the contributions have more of an impact than the investment return themselves. So that in and of itself is a pretty good story um, to actually um, you know, encourage pension funds to engage with their members. Again, you know, that differs between DB and DC in and of itself. Um, far more difficult in the DB space than the DC space. But I, I do think, I wanted to kind of come back to that um, sort of discussion about traditional asset classes, you know, and, and, and only seeing it through that lens. I think, I think that does present a potential difficulty between what pension funds are trying to achieve and trying to meet um, SDGs or, for instance, if you're trying to um, deal with place-based or regional issues, which I think you need to be able to combine um, asset classes sometimes in order to reach a potential impact. So, for instance, instead of just having a pure PE portfolio, you have a mix of PE, private debt, and um, real assets. And that probably works more in terms of being able to throw off cash um, more quickly, which can be better for uh, a potential pension scheme. And then also in the DC space, then you also need to create structures where you have liquidity. So I do think there is some innovation that needs to happen between you know, how the investment consultants are working with the pension funds to sort of reimagine, um, you know, asset class lines, and, and then also with asset managers and how they're putting together investment product. You know, if, if we go back to thinking about the kind of the DGF global balance type funds, I think we need to reimagine that market mm. to, to actually start to incorporate impact. So there's still work to do in that space. And I think that probably nicely ties into hopefully what Callum will come on to. Um, but yeah, but that, that's, that's, that's what we're seeing. But, and the only other thing that I would mention is I think it's creating a potential issue in that um, without the right advice, pension funds are setting themselves different net zero targets, different SDGs, speaking a different language. And I think it's only by bringing them together and consolidating views have managed to scale up the market in impact. And so I think we need more of that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and, and you're right, it does kind of tie into um, Callum, I guess, question for you. Um, hearing these barriers, and particularly from Charlotte, and you know, we've touched a little bit on things like um, it, liquidity, et cetera, you know, hearing the ba barriers, how do you think they can can be overcome and what role do you think consultants have in helping pension schemes overcome those barriers? Yeah, absolutely. So I think the barriers are particularly prevalent for DC schemes, given the need to have daily liquidity for members. Um, I have to say that those barriers have already been overcome in the industry. So there's more work coming or more regulations coming from the DWP um, to encourage investment in private markets, which should provide a su more supportive environment for trustees. Um, we have some concerns around how they're planning to go about this, but in general, the re direction of travel in terms of regulations will be support for private markets. But as I said, we've, we've already, already overcome those barriers and we have some great solutions to that. So to give a couple of examples, um, so one potential approach that, that we quite like that we've, we, we provided advice on in this situation to support the implementation is where private markets uh, involvement was within a blended fund. So there's a pooled fund, which in itself is daily dealing, and it has a target allocation of 50% to liquid assets and 50% to illiquid. Now, in that particular case, it's not actually impact, uh, which appreciates the discussion today. But as a framework, mm -hmm. that is a solution that can work. So a single pooled fund managed by uh, an asset manager with credentials uh, to manage the cash flow balance between mm. the two two aspects uh, and that will satisfy all of the the dc daily dealing needs um so that's one potential solution. The other, which I think will be more common, is the vast majority of DC schemes, certainly master trusts, um, where, where most of the assets will be moving to uh, over the course of the coming decade and beyond. Uh, most of them have blended fund, 
the mm -hmm. blended fund structures. So throughout an individual saver's journey, uh, their investment strategy will move over time from higher risk to lower risk as a, mm -hmm. a standard sort of lifestyling approach. And that tends to happen through use of blended funds. So not allocating to individual pooled funds, which is where some of the challenges around daily dealing come in, uh, but instead in blends, which themselves have an allocation to, you know, for example, you have ABC Master Trust Growth Fund, and that mm -hmm. growth fund will invest probably predominantly in equity assets, potentially some higher yielding bond assets, maybe some real estate in there as well as high level asset asset classes. Um, within there, they, this allocation can easily include a liquid. Um, because the, the requirement will apply to the blend in terms of daily dealing. Mm. So where you need to get to a level of comfort is that the blend can manage uh, the cash flow considerations and facilitate daily uh, liquidity uh, for the members. And you can do that by considering the balance between a liquid and li liquid assets, by considering the cash flows, which for DC schemes is massively positive and expected mm. to be so for, for decades to come. Um, so, so that that will be more of a concern where you've got transfers between master trusts, which is, you know, maybe in a decade to come when you start to see larger volumes of assets moving around. That's where the regulations we need to be supportive there to allow pots to kind of follow mem the, the underlying investments to follow members, at least until mm -hmm. their, their maturity. So I, I think I, I completely accept there are barriers, um, but the, those barriers, I think we've now moved into perceived barrier territory. Uh, mm -hmm. where there are now solutions to that. And there will be more solutions to come uh, over time as well. But the, there is no absolute barrier to illiquids for DC schemes. We've got great examples already of schemes successfully implementing illiquids. Nest mm -hmm. is probably the, the most prominent example. They have quite a large allocation now to, to uh, illiquid fixed income assets. Mm -hmm. um, we've advised on a master trust, which has a on a look-through basis, 10% allocation to, to a liquid credit and has mm -hmm. strategically allocated 6% impact, which will be fulfilled uh, over the course of the coming years as well. So mm -hmm. we're certainly seeing this as a direction of travel with that comfort building. Uh, and finally, Rachel, you mentioned around consultants getting comfortable. It requires a mindset shift. Mm -hmm. um, we can't look at track record, peer comparisons. There's there's not a homogen, homogenous group of impact yep. solutions there. Mm -hmm. We need to look, we need to go back to first principles. Uh, what are the objectives we're looking to de deliver, financial and otherwise, because there will be impact objectives as well over time. What are the beliefs of those responsible, the trustees, for example, in terms of their decision-making process? And then as consultants, we then have a duty to put forward solutions that fulfill those aims collectively in the most cost efficient manner um, and without uh, adding undue complexity to the strategy if, if there's no, no no bandwidth for that mm -hmm. but there, that's not an absolute barrier uh, as, as i suggested it just requires a mindset shift so mm -hmm. we're going to be committing capital uh, and then the, the the outcomes will be delivered over time we can't mm -hmm. look at track records we can't sort of reasonably compare strategies at this stage across the industry we need to go forward with first principles i would suggest and for schemes that sort of haven't thought about impact previously or who want to get involved in impact now how should they get started um you know obviously we've talked about some of the barriers um yeah but I guess, are there any sort of themes or products um, that you're particularly excited about? And um, we, obviously we mentioned nest allocation, but I guess if you were a scheme thinking, starting to think about this, where should you start? So starting point, again, using the first principles approach, what are your long-term objectives? DC schemes in particular will have objectives around delivering good outcomes for the members, mm -hmm. worded in one way or another. Um, but think about whether you want to have objectives around the impact uh, of, of investment decisions on the world around us. I think the important or, or uh, really useful way to feed into that is to consider member views. Um, so do you have any insights from your members? Mm -hmm. Traditional ways of engaging members through questionnaires uh, have limited success, but with the use mm -hmm. of technology, we can perhaps have more of an impact. There's some great, great tools out there now to, to gain insights from the members. The DC Investment Forum runs some fantastic studies. Uh, I think there's, there's one on the horizon, actually an updated one from last year. And they consistently show that members care about predominantly climate change, um, but also wider issues which are far reaching, um, but actually largely centre around social 
uh, social issues uh, to address those which which the, there have been in the past limited opportunity to do that through investment approaches i think what needs so a couple of things that trustees or governance committees can do i think first of all try to understand what what the things are that your members care about and um, you can get that directly from your members questionnaire surveys focus groups potentially use technology if you have access to that but try and get more than one uh, input to that would be helpful look at industry surveys um, and I think sec secondly which is really important is to engage with your uh, investment platform um, because I think one of the the main and this is a real barrier just now I feel is that uh, not all investment platforms have impact solutions available yet and I think this is one where trustees and governance committees can create the demand and um, because you can establish in your objectives or beliefs that you think this is something that will deliver overall a better outcome um, for your members and financially. Mm -hmm. And I think you can use that demand collectively to drive investment platforms to seek and add and qualify uh, appropriate impact investment solutions so that there is that full breadth of choice. Coming back to Jamie's point then, you know, most schemes have got their high level investment structure, equities, bonds and so on. Mm -hmm. There should be an impact option covering a range of different issues for each of those mm -hmm. um, so that every pension scheme can have access to the things they need to de deliver uh, the outcomes that, that they want to target. Um, and just a quick plug, if I may, we launched collectively an industry and impact uh, climate impact initiative uh, i'm really grateful to say jamie uh, and and charlotte from pensions for, for purpose have been fantastic supporters in that um a collective effort there real collective effort and what we're looking for is for investment platforms ultimately in dc space to add a climate impact option we think we can go much wider than that but we think climate is a good place to start mm. uh, and once we have the option members can select that uh, and ultimately, we want trustees and governance committees to think of this in defaults, uh, which they're already doing. But if we have it on the platform, it's, it's a great way to start. So, yeah, mm. I think lots of work to do. So I think barriers, platforms, we need all platforms to have an impact, a range of impact solutions available uh, and where they see gaps to actively engage asset managers in the community to share that demand to help drive uh, development of solutions. Trustees and governance committees, first principles, look at your objectives and beliefs, try to reflect your member needs mm. in that uh, and things they care about. Yeah, and I guess tying into the sort of beliefs piece in that first um, step, I know Charlotte, we've spoken previously about the um, the, the impact principles for pensions. So if, could you touch on that a little bit and, and how um, the discussions you're having, is there an increase in, um, in interest in, from pensions or only a few schemes? Are, are people sort of starting to talk about the principles and adopting them? Yeah, I think um, so the, the sort of first principle, so the Impact Investing Institute obviously put the principles um, document together off the back of um, a legal paper that was trying to dispel some of these myths around the compatibility of fiduciary duty with impact investing and concessionary returns and got past that point. And so the, the four principles that are effectively a good governance framework for pension funds are there to help the investment committee, the trustees to kind of get on board and go through this in a sequential way to think about what their objectives should be and then how that filters through to then how they align their consultant and managers, how they put together stewardship policies and how they measure impact. It's, I think it's all well and good going on the journey and start, you know, and putting together objectives, but you need to know what your end goal actually mm -hmm. is. And the other thing is that hasn't been mentioned yet is costs and fees. Mm -hmm. You know, so, um, you know, where does the cost lie to do this, to do the due diligence work? Does it sit with the consultants? Does it sit with the managers? Does it sit with, you know, and so it's about empowering yourself to ask the right questions. And so that, that's essentially what the principles do. Um, it helps you to think about these questions up front. And it's about um, also committing in a slightly different way. So it's not a tick box exercise. Pension funds um, become adopters. And we do um, interviews and case studies with them to understand how they're going through this journey. And that's really important because those will be published so that other peers can actually see how are pension funds addressing this on the ground and how can we use that as a framework for ourselves. So um, we've got um, a number of um, pension funds that have signed up, including Cluid, South Yorkshire Pension Authority and Surrey Pension Fund. And we're in close conversations with a number of other pension funds that we're getting on board. But we've also got the endorsement of the Investment Consultant Sustainability Working Group, the World Benchmarking Alliance, the Investor Forum, 
um, the, the Institute and Faculty of Actuaries. So there are a lot, there's a lot of really, really good support there. And we've got a number of consultants that are signed up as well. So essentially they're saying, we're going to take this to our, to our pension fund clients and prospects. And, and that's where you really need to get the action is getting people invested and bought into the concept and actually going through the different steps you need to take. So hopefully we'll see a lot more um, getting on board with that, you know, over the coming year. Yeah. Um, Jamie, I guess just sort of panning out and on Charlotte's discussion about kind of the impact industry and pensions in the UK, um, are there any sort of examples that you can think of of schemes that are doing um, impact particularly well? So there might be kind of international examples, but are there any in, in the UK? I know Callum's mentioned NEST. Um, but yeah, if you could give a flavour of kind of other schemes that are thinking about or alloc already allocating to impact. Well, that's the interesting thing, Rachel, that, which is to say that uh, we talk about the barriers and we talk about problems, but we've already heard from this group that there are people who've overcome these problems, mm. there are investors who've overcome them, pension funds that have overcome them, consultants that have overcome them. I mean, I would say that um, local government pension schemes that have a very strong sense of place and community have taken a much deeper interest in this than maybe others. So I would say we see really interesting work being done in impact investing by Greater Manchester, mm. Strathclyde, Cluid, we, we already mentioned. And so I, I do think that the, this activity is occurring. It's occurring in DB plans, it's occurring in DC plans. And I think it's one of the most important things we can do is mm. let people know this is possible in the existing framework, legal framework, the existing framework of fiduciary duty, the existing product mm. uh, availability, this, this impact investing is being done successfully. And um, I just think more people need to understand what their peers are doing to understand mm. that they can also be exploring this in a similar way. And I just think mm. the awareness is just, you know, quite an important aspect of this. Yeah, I think, absolutely. I think we spend too much time talking about barriers and not enough time making people aware of instances in which people have overcome those barriers. Mm. Sorry to interrupt. No, no, absolutely. I, I guess I was building on that in terms of um, it's also the the opportunity. So, you know, we talked about the barriers and they and they can be overcome. But also when we're talking, we talked a little bit about the kind of um, Callum touched on member views that we've talked about. Paul talked about the stories around the tech for good um, side. And I think there's a huge, there's obviously barriers, but there's also a huge amount of opportunity in the space to to kind of, as Charlotte mentioned, grow contributions, but also grow that member engagement and 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 bring to life um, people's savings and, and the impact that they're having. Um, guys, I'll move to a, a few wrap-up questions before we go to um, some Q&A. So, Jamie, if I could start with you, um, where do you think we'll be in five years um, with regards to pensions and impact investing? I think there are two big things to pay attention to. The first is the move to net zero, because I think that the move to net zero will drive an incredible focus on reducing negative impact in portfolios and then trigger a more explicit search for investments that provide solutions to carbon. And there's, there's huge momentum behind net zero. So the, um, just to give you an example, the net zero asset managers initiative was set up in December, 2020, seven months ago. They've now gathered support from 43 trillion of AUM call that 30% of total global managed assets. So among the asset managers, in seven months, we've already reached that level of support. Yeah. So I think it's what it's gonna do, it's gonna push pension schemes to do the things that Charlotte was outlining in terms of the process that you go through. If you have to deal with net zero, you're gonna do all those things. You're gonna set the objectives. You're gonna make sure you have competent advisors. You're gonna get involved in uh, shareholder engagement and then you're gonna measure your impact. Those things are all gonna happen. And although it's focused on net zero, I think there'll be spillover into the entire rest of the impact world. So that's, mm -hmm. I can have two things that I would just list. The net zero is one of the biggest themes I can think of over the next couple of years. The second one is a little subtler and that is double materiality. So I think double materiality, which is to say, not just what is the impact of sustainability risk on, your port, on the companies in your portfolio, but what is the impact of companies in your portfolio on society and the environment? That's the double materiality. I think that's coming. I think it will become part of fiduciary duty. What's really interesting to me, Rachel, is that the, there's already in 
in company law, there's a requirement in section 172 of company law that says directors must have regard to the impact of the company's operations on society and the environment. So you've already got this double materiality baked into profit seeking companies. It seems really odd to me that we haven't taken the step to make to give pensions the same obligations that for profit companies have to pay attention to what company, the impact companies are having on society and the environment. I think that's coming. Yeah, I would agree that, that yeah. Um, Paul, I might bring you in, in next. Um, how do you see the relationship between tech for good and pensions developing over the next few years? Um, so I think there's a couple of things that we, we've sort of seen signals weak signals if you like so one is around this engagement piece is that actually i think in five years time um we'll find it slightly weird that, that we have this idea that you just sort of sent your members a pension statement once a year with like you know how much was in their pot and uh, maybe a, there was there might have been a little magazine that had a few uh sort of a letter from the, the chief executive or something like that I, I think people will be looking at what is my pension doing on a daily basis, but they won't necessarily be looking at the financial side of it. They'll be looking at what is it doing for society. Um, and you know, I think you see that in the growth of not that it's not it's an entirely positive trend, but things like Robin Hood and all those kind of apps where where people obviously they care about money, but they care about you know other things too. And I think that idea that you know people engage in it much more often than they do at the moment um, is something that's going to become pretty normal. Um, the other thing I'll just I'll just raise because we haven't really talked about it, but uh, there is there is a, a serious risk I think as the opportunity grows that we do see impact washing as it is sometimes called now. Um, the idea that loads of potential providers of product in this space aren't really providing true impact products; they're just you know they're badging it impact, but potentially you know it's not. Uh, measurable it's not audited it's not you know uh, and i think there is a genuine risk of that um and again i think you know hopefully tech for good might be able to help a bit with that in terms of uh, spotting the, the things mm. that aren't uh, as 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 impactful as the, as they say they are in terms of you know technology is a very good way of of monitoring what's going on with money as well as um you know helping people's lives as well so um yeah i think those are those are the two areas that i see real really building in terms of the pensions industry is that that kind of engagement piece which i think there's a lot of opportunity to do that much better and and competitive opportunities well i think some pension mm. funds will do it better than others and they will get more members and get more contributions to be honest um and then the other side is yeah uh, the anti-impact washing uh, technology that i think we'll we'll see as well yeah absolutely it's a good point um Charlotte, what are your top recommended resources for people to engage and learn more in pensions and impact? Well, you might expect me to say this, but uh, <laughs> our, our platform has um, some brilliant sort of thought leadership. I think we have a, over a thousand articles now on our knowledge platform, and we also have more than 50 case studies. And we're working on case studies uh, with some of the adopters who have signed up to the um, Impact Investing Principles for Pensions. Um, so, yeah, so we have some great resources. The Impact Investing Institute has great resources, the Good Economy. And also, if you look at our uh, network supporters, we have a number of partner organizations that also have good materials that we point to. And we're quite um, prolific on social media, so it's, it's worth following us. Um, one of the things I was going to sort of um, leave you with, um, based on one of the training workshops that I did with the pension fund recently, is that um, I was faced with the, the comment, you know, well, you know, I'm a cynic when it comes to climate change and impact. And I, I actually went back and I said, frankly, it almost doesn't matter. Because the, the point is, is that transparency is coming and we are going to see more of the transition and physical risks priced into the market and we are going to see more in the area of impact weighted accounting we're seeing things coming out of SASB we know that natural capital is being valued so the idea that you just won't look at this because you are somehow a cynic of it almost doesn't matter all companies are going to have to report on it. It is going to be a risk to asset managers, a risk to investment consultants, mm -hmm. and it's all about how are they all going to bake this in. So in my view, you should be looking at impact across your portfolio, not even just in the in things where you're trying to have a positive impact. You need to be looking at net impact mm -hmm. um, in order to really understand what your position is and also to be able to evaluate risks and opportunities. So that, that's my mm -hmm. sort of concluding 
um, remark and some, what I'll leave you with. No, all, all really good point, Charlotte. And I, I, I'm also assuming that um, pension schemes can reach out to, to you um, if they are you know, needing any. So, yep. Um, Callum, last one. Um, what advice would you give trustees who want to start allocating to impact? Yeah, um, fantastic. So I, th I think probably two two things. Uh, first of all, I mentioned it earlier. I think seek and whatever using whatever tools you have at your disposal, referencing industry uh, research in this area. Seek to understand your member views uh, and the things they care about, because I think to then build on that and, and incorporate in your beliefs or objectives would be a, a really it's establish a really strong foundation for future progress. And I think the second thing is you, you need a really robust, uh, strong framework to take forward impact investing considerations. Uh, there's no point in reinventing something, something mm -hmm. exists that's already great, and that's the impact investing principles for pension funds. So I think, um, yeah, I would I would use that as a reference. We'll use that in our advice as consultants. Um, we're not going to go and recreate that. It's already a good framework. Um, so, yeah, I think two points. One, understand your member views, embed those in your objectives. And secondly, have a really strong approach to take impact investing forward in your decision making process and I think mm -hmm. impact investing principles. Yeah. Thanks, Callum. And thanks, um, panelists. I think we're going to move um, into some some Q&A. Um, if I go to the first one, um, how do the panelists propose the DC liquidity conundrum for impact private markets exposure be solved? I think we've touched on this a little bit about, you know, this is a, a barrier, but it, it's, it can be overcome. Um, but, but if there's anything else that anybody would like to add to that question specifically. Um, Callum, I might um, pick on yep. you for that one, um, given it's specific around the DC liquidity. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that the main points I would say there is actually I come back to something Jamie pointed out earlier. We, we need to focus the considerations around barriers more to the solutions that, that have been developed to solve those barriers. Um, there is no absolute barrier to introducing impact investing or indeed the liquids more broadly. Um, we shared a couple of examples earlier. Mm. I think to to understand how that relates to your particular scheme, always as always, engage your platform. Um, understand what they have on offer. If they don't have the liquid investments or impact investments, which we're focusing on here, available, challenge them on that. You know why is that the case? What do they have in development? Feed in the priorities that you have in terms of you know we talked about establishing establishing really strong objectives. Use those objectives to drive that demand for platforms to provide you with access to to investment solutions. Absolutely, yeah, it makes sense, and I guess um hitting out setting out those objectives and kind of beliefs as you mentioned Callum as a first step really sort of helps to frame that and and helps to define the path um Jamie a question for you um Jamie referenced investment trusts earlier interested to know um the views on the potential role of this market as a way of providing liquid and diverse ways of DC investors accessing impact opportunities could it be a complement to illiquid impact holdings the answer to that is yes, and just by way of disclosure, I'm a director of the uh, Schroeder's Big Society Capital Investment Trust, which is a diversified portfolio of private market investments listed on the London Stock Exchange. And so it does provide a market, it provides exposure to markets. It's got investment characteristics, risk return that would be acceptable to any market investor, but we're listed on the London Stock Exchange so that you can buy and sell the fund. Now, there are 15 billion pounds worth of investments on the London Stock Exchange, investment trusts that might qualify by somebody, just for someone's definition of impact investing. It's a combination mostly of social and supported housing plus renewable energy and energy efficiency. So there is, that does exist as a mechanism for providing liquidity. Uh, there are some people that don't buy investment trusts. Some, some pension funds don't like to get involved in that sector. I think it's something that people should be thinking more about as we consider mm -hmm. how much impact can occur in private markets. An investment trust is a really useful way to wrap it and provide the liquidity, governance, and transparency that people are looking for in pension funds. Mm -hmm. 
and, and Jamie, I guess a follow on to that one, particularly around the private impact markets, what is the capacity in the private impact markets to absorb institutional levels of investment, given how micro the opportunities tend to be individually? Well, and it's a, it's a good question, uh, but I, I, as I've said, there's 15 billion of it already, mostly relying on renewable infrastructure and social housing. But what mm. you're seeing is incrementally, you're getting more specified, um, more bespoke versions of impact. So now it's so now you're seeing housing for the homeless, not just generic social yeah. housing, but housing for the homeless. In the renewable energy sector, you're now seeing battery storage and not just the standard wind and solar. So I think what you can see is that in certain areas, there's plenty of capacity to absorb institutional levels. But um, uh, to me, it's a bit of a red herring in the sense that uh, institutions tend to dip their toe in the water first. And I think there's a virtuous circle that occurs that if institutions started to show interest, I think that would the sector itself would be able to expand capacity um, to respond to that. So it's not really a barrier. It's really, can we just get the virtuous circle rolling? And then I think um, some of the smaller providers could then start to expand their operations. I don't think there's any question that um, in the impact sector can respond to the current levels of demand and impact and mm. are growing it as the demand grows. Mm, absolutely. Um, Callum, I think one for you. Um, sorry to raise a further problem, um, but pension funds tend to be organized by regions, companies or industries and impact trends seem to be specific. So for example, climate change or social housing. Um, and the greater the impact, the more specific. How should we think about marrying the direction of impact and the desired impact for quite heterogeneous population of pension, of pension schemes? Yeah, fab. Th this sounds spookily similar to a subject Jamie and I will be discussing in a little while. Um, I think it's important to to first think of the makeup of the pensions market. Uh, I think we can divide it into chunks. I think Dean's raised some examples there of, of how to break it in terms of regions and companies. We could think of it differently. Um, so local government schemes, for example, are, are broken up by region. Uh, and we're already seeing, we have seen examples of local government pension funds allocating to local impact. Um, and I think the, Charlotte referenced this earlier, the case studies that, that Pensions for Purpose have available on the website will, will shine a light on the detail there. But it tends to be more sort of social impact bonds, social housing, uh, these kinds of invest, investment opportunities. So the local aspect is already happening there in, in local government space. Um, defined contribution space, we talked about DC schemes an awful lot here. Uh, I think there's appreciation it's a, you know, a growing opportunity set in terms of capital that could be deployed towards impact. And fulfill that virtuous cycle that, that Jamie articulated there as well. We think about the makeup then of DC schemes and the direction of travel towards master trusts. Not all master trusts, but most of them of scale in say 10 years time will be broad churches. So they will be there to, to deliver uh, a pension and investment solution to individual savers that could be based anywhere in the UK potentially. So the regional aspect and some of the specific impacts that they could be looking for are going to be really heterogeneous, which I think is to, to Dean's point. So I think it's going to make it really difficult, uh, potentially impossible for a master trust to allocate to specific impact issues. Um, but a bit of brainstorming, we did identify a potential approach that, that the larger uh, larger master trust could go down in future, which is to think of a, a, a pooled impact uh, investment vehicle, um, which targets a number of impacts, environmental, social, uh, for example. Um, and then we, we think about part of the opportunity being financial. So of course that, that vehicle would have to, to address the financial consideration. We see lots of opportunity and reason to be positive there. The other aspect is engagement. So we could, the Master Trust could, with technology, provide access to members to insights on the impact their money is having, but just in relation to the aspects of that impact, broader impact vehicle that they care about. Yeah. Uh, yep. for, for individual savers that want the money to have more of an impact on a particular issue, this is where the range of uh, self-select funds comes in. And I know that there's a little bit of caution uh, from many schemes just now because the scale is much less significant than, than for default assets. But longer term, I would expect self-select 
options to, to include a few more choices for individual savers to tailor their approach, not just from a financial perspective, which they have today, but also from an impact perspective longer term. Mm. Um, so yeah, I think that that is potentially a solution to that. And I think the technology is kind of there already to support mm. that because we're already seeing the kind of push notifications and nudge notifications come through from master trusts. Mm. Um, so it would be conceivable to have a a blended impact solution and have specific impacts that we've identified through a process that members care about uh, directed mm. to them to, to sort of repay that faith in the investment approach. Um, so yeah, I think I think there are ways the ways to solve this and uh, I'm absolutely not precious on one size fits all here. I look forward to the innovation we'll see over the course of the next decade as well. Mm. But yeah. it's a great, from Dean, it's a great point. Um, but I think it's one that we should, it, is a, it starts as a challenge but to Jamie's point earlier, I think we can quickly translate in this into actually as an opportunity here. Let's work together and identify useful ways mm -hmm. to solve that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, innovation in, this, in the space leaves a lot of opportunity. Um, Charlotte, I might um, end the last question on you. We're, we're nearly out of time. Um, but in a minute or, uh, or two, can you answer how does how do you think the UK pensions market compares to other geographies on their progress on impact? I know Pensions for Purpose is looking outside the UK. Um, so yeah, if you could take that last question. Yeah, and I think there's actually a bit of a segue between the last point and this point in a way, which is that um, you know some of the issues around impact investing and some of these things about reaching net zero targets are made more complicated by the fact that we have thousands of schemes, whereas in other countries, you know, they have a, a few hundred. I'm thinking about the Netherlands in particular, certainly um, an area where I've worked, where, um, you know, they have around 300 schemes. And so therefore the scaling opportunities, but the ability to drive down costs has been significant. But, but again, not to present a hurdle without a solution, um, we, are, we are addressing that. We've got the LGPS pools, they are starting to come together and look at ways that they can address net zero and the SDGs and actually bring together their member funds in the same way that we're then seeing that with the master trusts, we've got um, obviously collect, collective DC schemes. So we've got innovation that's actually happening around the structuring of pension funds that I think will actually help um, impact investing um, as well as the sort of product innovation and impact investing itself. So I think those, those two mm. things will come together to help us in the UK market. Mm. Great guys, thank you Charlotte. Um, and thank you to the panelists. Um, thank you to the attendees today. Um, as I mentioned, the session is being recorded and will be sent round to attendees after the call. Um, but in the meantime, just like to thank everybody and um, hope, hopefully get to revisit this um, topic sometime in the next few weeks or months. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Thank, thank you everyone. very much. Take care.